welcome to the latest edition of Planted Unearthed. My name's Sam Peters and I'm one of the co-founders of Planted, the first contemporary design show aimed at reconnecting people and spaces with nature. Following the success of the first Planted Unearthed series, we're continuing to explore how design, sustainability, architecture, food production and nature can combine to create cleaner, greener, healthier spaces. In series two, we're looking deeper into the issues surrounding access to nature and how to create spaces where caring for the environment, consuming responsibly and living sustainably all come naturally. Today, we're talking to Roddy Langmuir, practice leader at one of the UK's most progressive architecture firms, Cullinan Studio. With Cullinan Studio's stated aim of rethinking cities to make room for nature, it's easy to see why we at Planted would want to find out more about them. So Roddy, welcome to Planted Unearthed. Thanks, Sam. Well, it's, it's great to have you here. I mean, Roddy, why, why don't we start off um, just by asking you a little bit about Cullen and Studio, your your ethos and, and what sits behind the uh, your your business? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think in, uh, in relation to kind of architecture and nature, we've, you know, we've got a long history. We go back, I mean, Ted Cullen and, um, started the practice in the 60s and ahead of his time was was uh, very interested in incorporating natural settings into you know into a built environment and we uh, over the over the decades have looked at all sorts of different kinds of projects but one of the common um, uh, themes that runs through that body of work is how to embrace the nature that you find on site so the context that you have um, how to bring in daylight, how to um, ventilate buildings naturally, always trying to do things um, in a way which was in tune with the, the natural environment. So, you know, over the decades too, we now know much more about um, yeah, how we as people, we've always intuitively felt um, that we are impacted by our access to nature, but now we've got the evidence that that means it's uh, you know it can be it's a proven thing, and um, it's easier for us to talk to to clients about it you know in a very real way and to point out the benefits that uh, they can get from it. So I think I think um, it's a it's a big field. I think the pandemic has absolutely rammed it home. <laughs> mm. You know we've all felt it, and um, so so I think I think there's a there's a sort of groundswell um, towards doing things better. Uh, it's really interesting to talk about the pandemic, Roddy. And I mean, something we talk about a lot at Planted and what we indeed build our, our event around and our build our, our brand and business around is, is biophilic design. Um, could you talk about a little bit about biophilic design, what it is in simple terms and, and how it relates to Cullen Studios and, and also how the awareness seems to have have, have grown mm. enormously over the past twelve months. Well, I suppose the way I the way I interpret it is that you know there are there are patterns out there um, in the way we live and our our sort of human responses to our environment, which I say it's a way of kind of coding good design because I don't think. I don't think biophilic design is is necessarily anything other than good design. Mm. So, but it's a way of coding it and making the connections and the and the and visualizing the, the patterns which are in architectural responses. I mean, if you think back, you know, good architects have nearly always had an intuitive response, which is a biophilic response. So you know, if you look at Wright or Alto or, or you know, many of the many of the great architects, they uh, they practiced biophilic design a hundred years ago, um, and in fact, you know, you can you can trace it back as far as you want to go. So, but I think what's interesting is it's it's a language, it's a way of us talking about it and interpreting uh, design, which is relevant to us today. So that's its that's its use. And like other, you know, um, patterns, I guess it's there's a complexity there. Mm -hmm. But what I think I'm really interested in is the simplicity of um, a, a sort of biophilic approach. 
So, you know, if you get those things right on buildings, there's, you, you, you've done 90, the 90% of the good work is done. You know, if you've got the orientation of the building right, if you've got your, if you've harnessed um, the, the ecology of the existing setting, if you've um, organized your building in a way that, uh, that wraps and embraces and has views onto the nature that you have on your site, you know, if you've brought in the sunlight um, and daylight from the right directions, if you've let the air pass through your building in a, in a, a natural way, um, if you've done all those things, that is, you've got a, you know, you've got a very strong uh, biophilic response. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's where I feel the, the value is in it. And in terms of um, the commercial value here, I mean, it, it, people, we've often explored and understandably, I guess, for, to an extent, perhaps environmentalism and interest in nature and um, a green agenda has been seen as almost a kind of a, a niche area or something that's a nice to have, perhaps. Yeah. What, what's, I think what you've hinted at already and what I'd love to explore now is this idea that it's gone beyond that now to a, a must have and not just commercially uh, but i mean perhaps if we could talk about the commercial imperative first and because and the, the effect this has on people in their working spaces yeah i mean i, I think the uh, the commercial value is of course rooted in in real in real things in real benefits and real um ways that people appreciate um, you know, the way something's been designed. So I think it's quite, I mean, we've, we've uh, learned a lot in applying it in a medical setting. So something where uh, there's, a, there's a science, you know, to, um, to what we've been trying to do in that we're trying to, we're, we're dealing with children's mental health in the Older Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool. And so we're creating, um, you know, buildings for a whole cluster of services there a residential building too, for people with quite severe mental health problems. So they're working with the clinicians there and seeing how they work and, and how they do their consultations and the kind of problems that you have and trying to address those in, in a quite extreme environment, if you like, mm. Uh, mm. in those terms. It's been interesting uh, to see what stuck the course because we had a lot of ideas. Some mm -hmm. of them blasted you know, through and are in the design and some didn't make it. Yeah. Um, but those principles of, I guess, um, a couple of a couple of things, taking um, our building circulation around a courtyard garden so that everyone's reference is always to this garden and the garden itself becomes a, a consultation place, you mm -hmm. know, a, a place that's used in the um, in the natural way that the building circulation, you know, leads you into it, and it's used as part of the facility that the building offers. Um, I think the materials, you know, getting down to to trying to make a, a building less institutional, um, you know, using timber, and we've used it in a very robust way. We've used it as the structure of the building, so you know, it's going to endure, and it has a, a solidity to it, I guess, too. But um, so it's, uh, I think there's devices we're using. We're using um, bay windows in the consultation rooms, which create a small space within a big space mm -hmm. that give you a, a, a kind of almost like a secret uh, side view to a park landscape beyond. So it's that, that within a consultation room, a child can, can sit into this bay window and mm -hmm. kind of almost half escape. Mm -hmm. um, and this would would be to help encourage the conversations with the uh, the consultant. Um, so a sense of safety, almost, and a sense, a sense of security. Of safety, a sense of security, and I think um, you know a window a window to landscape is a very good uh, calming calming device. Yeah. Um, so there's always that wonderful thing about the bay window, which where you step out through the wall. You know, mm. into the street or into the into the landscape. Uh, it's almost a, a space apart from the house, and I think those those kind of um, devices are always known to have worked. We've used them throughout time, 
but actually using them in a clinical setting is interesting. So getting back to the value, um, I think, I think yes, um, the pandemic has focused their attention on how to how to make spaces um, you know work in different ways. At home, we've all had to had to learn how to work from home. Um, and what does our home not give us that we've needed? Um, but our workplaces also are going to change in the same way that, um, you know, coming back to work, a lot of uh, people are going to be, you know, splitting their time between uh, working from home and working in the collaborative sense in, in offices. So workspaces are being valued more for their potential for collaboration and the, the creation of a good social environment and a nice environment to be in. And the, the natural um, you know, connections that you can make with, with landscape, um, you know, with light, with, uh, with fresh air, that's all a part of making a really good workplace now. And I think the, you know, the, the evidence is there for us to prove it too. So, so I, think there's a, I think there's a need, I think there's a desire. And if you think of sort of future-proofing space as well, if mm. you're going to future-proof um, space you're going to make sure it's got all these qualities mm. because you know that's where that's where um we're going i was just going to ask you about that Roddy. that very point i mean i guess for any organizational business now who's looking at either building a completely new space creating a completely new space imagining a new space or or kind of as you might put it retrofitting somewhere i guess in order to i mean now that this kind of myth i suppose that people working from home are in some way less productive or obviously um, many, many different sectors have seen that that's not the case and that people can work from home. So if people, if businesses do want to find a reason for people to, they're going to have to find reason, positive reasons for people to attend the office if that's really the way that organisations want to go, I guess. So making them welcoming, um, engaging, community type spaces and, and based upon the biophilic principles it is is going to be again a, a kind of a, a yeah. negative in many ways yes it's kind of it's distilling out the activities that the office the, the setting that the office provides that you mm. can't get um you know at home and making sure that those um the office is geared to to improve those to make those even better than they were before you mm. know so, yeah i mean i I, I think it's quite exciting, really, sort of mm. going forward, that, that these changes, which were probably going to happen gradually, um, are being, you know, uh, thrown at us. And the, the, the transition is going to be much quicker um, mm. Mm. because we've all been forced to um, work in a particular way that where we've been so polarised, I guess, that we've, we can now appreciate what we need to do back in our offices, you know, yeah. to improve them. And it's given us time, I guess, and people like yourself at Cullen and Studios time to actually have that imaginative and creative space that perhaps it was um, hard to find before. <laughs> yeah, time. I mean, I think the pandemic has has there's been a sort of general slowing. It's a bit like when you get out of the car and onto a bike and you go through the same <laughs> landscape. You see it in a different way. Very much. I think we've, we've all seen life um, in a in a in a different way, and so that. You know brings out new possibilities so no it's just exciting. it really is and obviously we're at planted you know really excited to have, have found um groups and organizations and, and practices like yourself roddy who, who are, are so on point with this and it feels like you you guys are the future of, of design and architecture and i mean talking about cycling there um you know outdoors and and we're not just talking about indoor design here when it comes to biophilia and those principles but i mean how, how do you imagine few big big question of course but i mean future cityscapes changing and uh, we talk yeah yeah i mean I, I think we our feeling we worked a lot with the the uh, recently uh, with the automotive industry which mm -hmm. might seem seem a strange uh, subject to bring up when you when you're talking um talking about biophilic design but what's what's really interesting is that industry is transforming Mm. And um, we've done a done a building for Jagger Land Rover and Tata Motors and Warwick University, um, which is up in Coventry, and that's a research building looking ten years 
15 years ahead with the sort of research that's going into autonomous vehicles and the questions that you that you you know that come from this are well what's the street going to be like mm. in the future and the the autonomous vehicle future is electrification to go through first which is going to clean up our cities in terms of the pollution the air pollution that we have in in city centers uh, there still will be some they still haven't solved the you know the the tire uh, tire pollution issues but uh, a big difference by um you know switching electrifying the the uh, individual transport system and the and the public transport system mm -hmm. so then you know uh, the uh, the the thing that's going to change most after that is that cars will be more of a service and less more of a shared service and less of um, an individual ownership you know um, product so therefore you won't need to park your car on your street and suddenly all this space in our streets is going to be up for grabs so what's going to happen to that space um and i think the the, the street it's so exciting to think of streets without having to provide that parking mm. space you know suddenly you've got a a couple of meters um, strip to work with, which is a tartan stripe, you know, mm. throughout the city. Um, <laughs> and, you know, what are we going to do? Well, it takes us ulterior motive there to getting a tartan stripe through a city, Roddy. <laughs> not at all, not at all. No. Um, but I just, I just think that, um, you know, the opportunities for um, building a better sense of community, I mean, these things go beyond, uh, you know, it's, it's not about plants it's about people and, mm. and um and you know getting getting the city to be more humane but getting it to be also to embrace nature and to be more seamlessly connected to its hinterland which has mm. always been we've always had this this idea that uh, you know nature and the city don't mix very well well we've got to do much better so the streets yeah. the streets one place our roofs. I mean, if you look across London from the air, you know, you see how many roofs are being used. Landscapes are going up onto roofs. People are using the roof to to enjoy um, the view, enjoy the sun. Um, but you know, we need landscape at every level uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to work on. Lots of people are working on on green facades, of course. Um, and there's a huge amount of greenwash going on as well, which you know we're we, we need to be wise to. Um, so, I think I think the, the the big changes coming in the city. Green infrastructure is fantastic. You know, you no yeah. longer need to have to segregate your infrastructure out into into sort of desperate uh, polluted zones. Um, you can actually bring it in and 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 live with it. I mean, that's that you've touched on a couple of points, and now you know appreciate the fact that we're, we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately, Roddy. But I mean, for just even to the idea of reclaiming that space the car parking space and the benefits that would have as someone who um i lived in the city for many many years but decided to leave because I, as a runner um I, I found breathing the fumes dodging in and out of cars jumping in between parked cars inhaling the air um of, of static vehicles just overpowering and then of course you talk about or I, we had a, a child who came along our, our little precious daughter ella and you know, pushing a pram along a, a high street, which was just at the same level as exhaust fumes, was just just felt like a terrible thing to do. So a really exciting picture you've painted there of, of, of space being created where those vehicles were previously, I think would, will really resonate with our viewers a lot. And also the sense of reconnecting um, the city with the natural environment. And I mean, just, just finally, Roddy, if I may just ask, you know, something we're really excited by, I think, at Planted as, as this kind of conversation changes driven by, by people like yourself. But, um, you know, it, is it possible for us to create cities where people don't want to escape from anymore, where where they actually value the, the space and, and the, the community and the, and, and the, the natural and green spaces that are there? Um, I, I think for sure it is. And that's, you know, if you ask anyone to 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 draw their or visualize their ideal environment, it's full of plants. You know, mm. the city is full of plants, and there's no reason why you know we can't we can't make it so. Um, so I, and I think the 
the real value is also in making productive landscape. So I don't think it's just making it as a, it's not just a visual treat. It's, it's productive landscape. Um, you know, of course it's, it's carbon. It's all the, all the issues we know about now um, as well. But I think, you know, I'd love to see food growing on a major scale coming back into, into cities, um, which, you know, seeing, seeing plants being cultivated, we know there's a desire for that in, in communities. So maybe that's what, uh, that's what the streets might contribute to in the future. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, what a wonderful picture you've painted there, Roddy, of, of, of uh, cities in the future and uh, the connection that we may find and uh, between um, spaces and, and nature um, in, our, in our cities of the future. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Roddy, from Cullen and Studios. And thank you so much for, for your time. Um, I'm certainly going to uh, be reading the book that you guys kindly sent us, which is The Cullen and Studio in the 20th Century by Hugh Pearman, which really is a wonderful read and, and illustrates a lot of um, what Roddy's just been discussing, um, beautifully illustrated and produced, uh, but uh, which I can't recommend highly enough. So, um, Roddy, thank you for your time. Um, that just leaves it for me to say, if you've enjoyed today's series of Planted on Earth, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, details of which can be found on our website, www.planted-cities.co.uk. On there, you'll find more great editorial content from some of the leading writers and thinkers on design and sustainability, as well as exciting news about our flagship event in London, which I'm delighted to say will, COVID restrictions notwithstanding, take place at King's Cross from September the 23rd to the 26th. We very much hope to see Roddy and his uh, team from Cullen and Studios there. Watch out too for news of our excited Planted Members Club, which we'll be launching in time for the summer. So that just leaves it to me to say thanks again to Roddy from Cullen and Studio. Thanks to our friends at Horticus Living for your help in styling our set. And thanks to you for watching. My name is Sam Peters, and this has been Planted Unearthed.